You are listening to the global network of podcasters dedicated to the pharmacy profession. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Welcome to This Week in Pharmacy. I'm your host, Todd Yuri, founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. This has been a very busy week. We were in Boston for the National Association of Chain Drug Stores Total Store Expo. What an amazing experience that that was. A shout out to Steve Anderson, the CEO of the NACDS who was able to uh, leave us a, a short interview about the organization and forwarding uh, chain pharmacy throughout the nation and how supportive they are uh, for all of pharmacy, not just chain, but their fight in PBM reform. It was exciting to talk with him. I want to give a shout out to their whole team. We have an exciting three-part series coming up, which should be releasing sometimes next next week. So, be on the lookout for the NACDS Total Store Expo post show from the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to Bruce Nealon, um, who is one of our hosts, uh, 40 plus host on this network. Uh, Bruce is a wonderful uh, host. He's just amazing. He runs the Pharmacy Crossroads podcast, and there is a special episode out with Nicole McClure and David Falk. And it's all about marketing and how marketing is used to boost pharmacy business. Uh, take a listen from Bruce. Hi, this is Bruce Neeland. I get to be the host of the Pharmacy Crossroads podcast. Pharmacy Crossroads is proud to be a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I can't wait to listen to the next episode of This Week in Pharmacy. This episode with Nicole and Dave Falk will dig down marketing uh, that can be done specifically in your pharmacy and how that's going to make a difference uh, for the rest of your year uh, as we are we're stressed out this year with so many changes that came from uh, payment models, PBM reform. But there are so many people on this network that care about the survival of the pharmacy profession uh, for example, uh, this week we had business lessons to put into use for today from Happier at Home PRN. This is a podcast that's put out by Debbie Marcello, who runs Happier at Home, which is an organization that's dedicated to the success of our community pharmacies by having them embed a home care service into their community pharmacy and then be able to build revenue that is cash-based revenue and not tied to our PBM prescription revenue. We also talked with Michael Hogue, Dr. Michael Hogue, the CEO of the American Pharmacists Association, as they dive deeper into PBM reform, and they're exploring the Equitable Community Access to Pharmacy Services Act. And I really, really think that you need to listen to this if you haven't to already. It will give you an update on how the APHA is taking action in PBM reform. Also, a shout out to Dr. Marina Buskov, who is a pharmacist and network uh, leader on the Pharmacy Podcast Network, digging into holistic medicine and how the business programs that she is working with um, her consultancy team will help you build your own consultancy business if that's what you're interested in as a pharmacist that combines pharmacology with uh, the, the world of natural medicine, as well as food as medicine. Food as medicine was actually a topic at the NACDS TSE Total Store Expo, and we'll be talking about that um, in an upcoming uh, show around the NACDS. All right, what about Mindful Meds? This episode came out from the Geriatric Pharmacy Focus podcast by Dr. Tamara Rugels who is now launching uh, the Geriatric Pharmacy Focus. And this is an extension of um, her insights around long-term care pharmacy. This is a replacement for our long-term care pharmacy podcast. 
And I'm excited that she's continuing to grow her content out through the Pharmacy Podcast Network. It's been exciting working with all of you pharmacists that have participated. We've interviewed literally hundreds and hundreds of pharmacists over the last 15 years. However, we know we don't have everything. So if you have a subject that you would like to dive into, if you have a subject that you think is not being covered, would you please let us know? Would you please send me a message at publisher? at Pharmacy Podcast. Once again, that's publisher at Pharmacy Podcast. And let us know what content might be missing that you'd like to learn more about, whether that be a series or may maybe it's you. Maybe you come on and talk with an expert or talk with somebody that digs down into a specific sector of uh, pharmacy healthcare collaboration. Um, and, uh, and just let us know how to continue to build better content for you as a pharmacy care leader. We are going to jump into news. Uh, there's so much going on in our profession. Excited to be sharing uh, news that is coming from Pharmacy Times. In this article that just came out this week by Paige Clark. Paige is a pharmacist and working for Prescriptive Health, which is a technology platform. And she writes, understanding pharmacy deserts, how can we impact this growing trend? And it goes into the fact nearly thir a third of independent pharmacies uh, could close in 2024, according to an NCPA survey. And uh, Paige goes into telling the story about her home state of Oregon being an example where a recent report from the Associate Press found that 36 stores in Oregon closed in 2023, with the state uh, being second only to Alaska in terms of limited pharmacy access. And this is gonna make um, the, the nation um, suffer and it's gonna be a public health issue that we're not gonna be able to have enough pharmacy coverage. Uh, this is not a good thing really for, for anyone, certainly not good for our profession, um, but we need creativity. Uh, we are in a situation that's gonna probably continue to get worse. We need creativity from our pharmacy uh, associations, our state associations, the national associations, and you that are listening in the uh, trenches as to what can be done to try to uh, mitigate the risks that are going to be created by not having pharmacies where we need them. And this next article, which I want to mention, is, uh, is just as important, and it plays into this. It plays into... Uh, everything that we talk about on the on the this week in pharmacy, and more specifically lately about pharmacy deserts and uh, the need to build sustainable care models that must expand the role of our pharmacists. Uh, this is written by Luke Halpern, who's assistant editor at Pharmacy Times, and this article goes down through several questions with senior vice president for pharmacy growth at Walgreens. Uh, Rena Shaw, and they discuss the future of the sustainable care models in the pharmaceutical industry and how technology is a huge part of growing and how um, Rena also explains areas of community pharmacy that she sees potentially changing um, in favor of community pharmacy over the years and um, how important that's going to be uh, to continue to invest in pharmacy business models that can keep up with the needs. Uh, our nation is expanding. We're going to have 345 million people here over the next three to five years. And uh, what, 300,000 300, active pharmacists. And if you do the math, you probably understand it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a good situation. So question was asked, uh, what do you feel the future of sustainable care models hold in the pharmaceutical industry? Let's take a listen to Rena. Everything pharmacy every day. So the first question that Pharmacy Times posed was, what do you feel the future of sustainable care models hold in the pharmaceutical industry? And it kind of goes into what really, you know, I spoke about earlier is the digitization of where pharmacy can be. You know, at the end of the day, we need to be smarter about the talent we have. We know that there aren't going to be as many providers in the future, maybe pharmacists, 
nurses, you know, physicians, so on and so forth. And so to create a sustainable care model, we need to ensure that we're embracing an operating model that allows for that. But secondary, secondary is really having a reimbursement model that allows for that environment. And so continuing to focus on payment reform and um, partnering with our government affairs team as well as senators and House of Representatives so that we can continue to ensure that our pharmacies and our pharmacists get paid for the incredible value that they provide. How have you utilized sustainable care models in your position at Walgreens? In my entire career of being able to really drive uh, the future state of what we can do, uh, it started off with creating new services. May it be expanding beyond what we dispense, may it be through immunizations or testing um, services where we're expanding the role of the pharmacist. Uh, secondary to that is working with our managed care partners, may it be payers or PBMs or others that are out there to allow for new reimbursement models that may have not existed before. And then being able to innovate on the model, leveraging technology in a way that we haven't in the past. And so offering solutions that are really customer centric, may it be delivery, may it be two-way texting with your pharmacist, uh, you know, or even just AI so that we're smarter about how we engage and what we can do in a much more effective way. Is there an aspect of community pharmacy you can see significantly changing over the next few years? I would say one of the biggest aspects is that I've, at the end of the day, especially where technology is going, I'd imagine that we're going to be redefining what convenience means for our patients. And that means that redefines how our pharmacists deliver care to our patients. And so we'll still have our community pharmacists, but they might just show up a little differently to our patients. May it be, you know, via a virtual consultation uh, when, you know, the patient is on their couch and that pharmacist is within their own home and being able to provide that type of service. But really, um, you know, at the end of the day, we can paint whatever picture we want. Uh, it's really about the relationship between our pharmacist and patient to deliver that best outcome. Final question, was there anything else that you'd wanted to add? So the one thing that we're doing at Walgreens is really recentering what pharmacy means to our team members as well as to our patients. And so there is a double down from our perspective so that we can make sure that we continue to stay in communities that need us the most. But that means we're having to really take an aggressive stance in how we engage from a customer perspective, you know, being able to uh, provide digital solutions to be able to provide solutions for our team members so that they can be able to spend time with our patients. May it be through micro fulfillment centers where we're automating pharmacy all the way to offering home delivery, you know, being able to offer that for patients that need it the most uh, for their front end products. So uh, the great thing is, is that innovation is con is and change is constant. And uh, that just makes me being a pharmacist that much more exciting. So, you know, I like what Rena said. I like the positivity. I like the fact that um, that they're concerned, uh, understand that Walgreens uh, does not own a big PBM like, um, like CVS does. And they're going through the same um, domino effect of what's taken place and them having to shut down stores across the United States and creating <clears throat> staffing issues. But here's the thing. I think with the intelligence and with the people that work at Walgreens on the business side, not necessarily the pharmacy care side, we know that they knew what was coming. And it's intense now because it has to be because stores are closing and we can't sustain and the payment models have been so crooked uh, towards profitability instead of actually using that money for care and for staffing and for technology upgrades that it's kind of like a you know if i could if we could sit uh before the board of walgreens we would ask them why in the world didn't you think about these things three years ago when you saw what pbms were doing and had the runway to start making changes as a very significant force in pharmacy. Think about this, of all of the pharmacies that represent even just services in the United States, parts of Canada, Walgreens is pretty significant. I think everybody would agree with that. 
So if they stood up to the PBMs two, three years ago, we would be in a much different situation than we are now. Um, even partnering with community pharmacies, independently community pharmacies throughout the nation, uh, once again, three years ago would have would have been a whole different picture. But it, now we're playing catch up. We're playing, let's be as positive as you can with what's happening and the collapse of pharmacies throughout the country that cannot be left open because they, they can't afford to leave them open and adjusting and what these future payment models are going to become. The pharmacy deserts will increase. It's not going to, it's not, uh, it, it's nothing that's going to change uh, anytime soon. It's actually going to get worse before it gets better. But um, I, I just, I think that there could have been more done by Walgreens specifically in challenging the status quo of where we're at right now with the PBMs. And it should have done, been done. If, if in fact they're saying what uh, Rena was saying right now, once again, I think this should have been something they could have thought about uh, years ago. All right. I did want to bring up community pharmacists can impact disparities in care, delivery, and access. This is a uh, article that came from Drug Topics this way this week, and it's um, it's an interesting article. I want you to to jump in. I'm going to give you a preview of this. Uh, let's listen in. How can potential disparities in care addressed by implementing? That's a good question. So disparities in care, we know they exist and we know that specifically underserved communities have health disparities and diabetes. So how can we have more impact as we implement programs in community pharmacies? honestly through access or addressing these external factors that can have impact beyond just the medical component. So impacting things like social drivers of health. So thinking about access to medications, access to providers, access to education, food, healthy resources, access to being able to just exercise or walk around your community. I think that addressing disparities, of course, you can't address all disparities through social drivers of health, but you can start to have impact. And while all disparities aren't directly related to or correlated with drivers of health, I think that you can have tremendous impact by just starting there. So starting with the holistic view of a person's health and not just the medications or medical components. A lot of Americans, of course, have diabetes, prediabetes, but I think the biggest barriers to care our access. We have the tools in the toolbox that we need to have impact. So we have the medications, we have the research, we have evidence of things that can help improve A1C, but access or giving access to communities across the U.S. to these resources is vitally important. So yes, we have the tools in the toolbox, but we need to disseminate or give everyone the tools that they need to be successful. So I think the biggest barriers to achievement of clinical outcomes or health goals is just access to care. Access to care is the biggest, right? And I agree. I absolutely agree that access to care is a major issue and uh, how it's addressed could be different for each community. But um, that is the biggest problem. And Dr. Jasmine Perry, PharmD, who's a clinical pharmacist with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, um, was referenced by Drug Topics at the NACDS uh, 2024 Total Store Expo. And the access to care for people that don't have pharmacies in their community anymore, that's pretty important. Uh, that is uh, dangerously important and relevant uh, to the question, what's the biggest issue in pharmacy? And, and, if, and if Dr. Perry says it's access to care, I... I actually agree. It is access to care. Um, I I think that the whole um, domino effect of what's taking place in the pharmacy profession, once again, we haven't seen it bottom out. We haven't really seen the worst of it because the other things are going to have to happen to really get PBM ref, PBM reform to to truly change how things are are paid, who's paid, when are they paid, how fast are they paid, is it sustainable? Um, part of this is us as a profession coming together and, and having as much information and as much public relations and as much communications as we can. And there is an aspect of this in the creative where movie makers are, are also getting involved. I want to show you and share with you if you're listening uh, to this uh, clip that's coming from the Harmacy film. Once again, that's Harmacy. You can find more at Harmacy film.com but take a listen to this 
Hey, and I wanted to mention something to you real quick, and that is the film called Harmacy. And I'm not sure if you've seen this reel, this advertisement for this movie coming out. But think about this. The most important aspect of our pharmacists, I don't care where you work, any part of the world, literally, the number one purpose is to keep people safe. Let's take a look. 100,000 fatalities in the U.S. because a patient took the wrong medication. The numbers are hard to fathom. My 26-year-old son aged off of my health insurance, went to the pharmacy the first time without insurance to buy his insulin, couldn't afford it, went home and started rationing, and a few days later was found dead in his apartment. They play a critical role getting you your medications and care, but like many healthcare positions, pharmacists, they're in short supply. Some staff members at major U.S. pharmacy chains like Walgreens and CVS walked off the job this week over working conditions. 2018, I was started at $9 an hour. After I got my tech license, it was $11.50. When I became nationally certified, it was $12. Hello, no one is available to take your call at this time. Putting it flat out there, it, it is a different stressor when this pharmacy A is closed, but B is so busy they can't answer the phones, and C is so busy they can't pull it, and D you can't get a, a transfer from. The complaints that we are getting from patients and other pharmacies that got a prescription that is stuck in the system or has been processed or e-prescribed because the physicians also think it's open, and then they pull up and it's closed. Just left our local pharmacy from dropping off the prescription for my son. Uh, uh, pharmacists and pharmacy techs, y'all doing all right? What the hell is going on? You're going down with the ship, it looks like. Oh my goodness. Little Rock, please. Hello. Uh, are you the pharmacist? Yes, sir. Is this whole line ground around the building? Yeah, it's all the way up the back over there. Okay, and the start line. Yeah, it's like eight cars back. Eight cars back. Okay. They're they're closing down from here back. Tell yeah. I understand that they they told me to come out here and shut the line down because they got to get out at a certain time. It's not it's not me. It's them. Yeah, what is it, my husband? It's just so stressful. I need an anxiety medication. I took my 30 minute break, but is 30 minutes in 12 hours really, is that even sufficient? If we can't answer the phone at all, like that's a, that's a problem. That's a major staffing problem right there. I was having a miscarriage and still went to work the next day with a pair of pens on. The IT team has learned there are more than 2.3 million dispensing errors made at U.S. pharmacies, and it's happening every year. Okay. So, Harmacy, the Harmacy film, look it up. Uh, if you have a way of supporting this organization and these people that are internal to our pharmacy profession uh, to uh, donate to them, please definitely do so. It's going to be an important film to get out to the public to really bring to light the reasoning behind these issues. The public has no idea. They think it's the pharmacy individually. They have no idea that PBM reform has had such a horrible, terrible, uh, dangerous impact that has caused people to be sicker, uh, caused people to die, um, and have caused uh, major harm on our pharmacy infrastructure, our pharmacists and our technicians. Uh, it's just it 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 just keeps going and going, and it's not gonna, it's not going to get any better until uh, until we all stand up and and really just don't take it anymore and let let reform do what it's supposed to do. Support by reaching out to your state representatives and let them know what you know. If you can bring them to your pharmacy, if you have any way of doing that, even if you're in long-term care or specialty, definitely community, let them tour, let them know what you do as pharmacists and caring for people. Let them know how important um, PBM reform is. And on this week in pharmacy, I would like to jump into one of my favorite subjects, which is marketing. More specifically, the HCP, Healthcare Provider 
uh, focused marketing education really comes along with that marketing and then organizations that are focused on healthcare and not necessarily the B to C uh, side of this uh, business to consumer. I'm talking about the B to B, which is really where our strength is as a publication through pharmacy podcast network. I'm welcoming back Vince Grippy, who is the founder of Grippy uh, media and um, he does a ton of uh, marketing consulting as well as white paper creation in the space of healthcare specific marketing. Uh, Vince, it's so great to have you back on This Week in Pharmacy. Hey, thanks, Todd. It's great to be back here. Happy to be uh, a part of the show again. Absolutely. And I want to kind of uh, start off by talking about a LinkedIn post that you um, put out um, back in August, uh, beginning of August, August 9th. And it kind of went through evergreen marketing. And just for the listeners, if you are in marketing um, and if you are a pharmacist that's in marketing, uh, Vince, lots of pharmacists are now building their own brands specific to something that they're very uh, sensitive to and in diving into and digging very deep into. We have pediatric pharmacists focused specifically on uh, children's medication management. We now have Maternal RX and Daniel Plummer, she, Dr. Plummer, is just focused on maternal health. We have Sex Farm D, um, Geriatric Pharmacist Review. So we have a lot of pharmacists who are going deep. And part of going deep is being able to build evergreen marketing content as a long term strategy that aims to create that value within the brand for its customers uh, to be an influencer. And then, of course, to keep up with trends, tying it into um, that brand. And I kind of want to talk to you today about brand identity and content and advertising and and what's coming to be as as you and I as marketers are seeing a rise in uh, going deeper rather than wider and becoming an expert marketer in specific content. So let's kick this off with the um, with the the LinkedIn article that you wrote about, and then Rick's going to lead us into like the five top trends that are coming out of uh, B2B and healthcare marketing? Sure, yeah. So the, the article that, that you're referring to is actually a newsletter of ours uh, from a newsletter that we run called The Grip on LinkedIn. And it was referencing an article from Digiday, a you know, prominent digital marketing publication. Uh, the article basically discussed how nowadays uh, we're seeing this shift from marketers starting to kind of veer a little bit away from performance marketing, not entirely, but, but you know, make, I guess, the, the idea or the art, if you will, of brand building more of a priority, uh, not just in the short term, hence the evergreen part is the, a long term sort of a tactic. And where I think that comes from is for so many years, especially having done this in, for 16 years now, when, when, when you're uh, going to your CFO, you're trying to get a budget and marketing department, you know, you need to justify the ROI. And uh, I could tell you, especially in healthcare, a lot of CFOs, brand awareness, engagement, those numbers don't mean anything to them, or at least for the longest time they didn't. Uh, and so, you know, you have to show them things like leads generated, sales, et cetera. And the way you usually do that is by investing in more performance marketing based tactics, things like paid media, sponsorships, partnerships, uh, attending conferences and what have you. But, you know, nowadays, as, as we're kind of seeing a lot of ad budgets sort of tighten for these brands and also, you know, the kind of dynamics of the market shift. Uh, where I guess what you would say is audiences are are, are, are thirsty for more of a, a human element to a brand. They want to be able to interact with a brand, get better information from a brand, especially at a time where generative AI's use is at an all-time high, right? I mean, content can get churned out at the snap of your fingers. Yeah. Uh, any chatbots you interact with, not sure if you're actually dealing with support or if it's just a chatbot, you're not really building a brand those ways, right? You, you need a deeper, more personalized connection with the brand and have an experience that goes beyond just an ad uh, in your news feed or beyond an automated email that's just fired off whenever you take an action. Uh, again, you know, just sort of the way to look at it is you, you say you look at a, uh, a, a healthcare device, right? You take a look at a, 
uh, you visit a website that's got like, um, I don't know, it could be anything like a blood pressure device or something. Then you go on over to Facebook, Instagram, and all of a sudden you're seeing ads for this thing everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like proposing on the first date, right? I have no connection to your brand. I don't know how reputable you are, how much you actually care or know about this space, or if you're just another one of those advertisers trying to get a quick buck out of me. And I think in the short term, especially as we saw during uh, the lockdown, and especially in the tech sector, those ads, people were doubling down on them because, you know, they worked. People were bored. You're in your home. And, and, that, and that's, that's one thing. Any connection was a good connection. Uh, but now it, it's, it's different, much different, you know, and, and people are looking for more human connection, more human experience. And when we think of the ads that are going out to the consumer, Vince, versus ads that I use to reach the HCP, this is much different. I'm creating something that becomes very personalized to the subject so that the ads that I run support that content. So everything that you see on Instagram, always that's the short firm. That's the less than one, one minute of content, maybe a splice of maybe an interview. But the graphics, uh, the posts, it's all prefacing the longer content, the more sincere content and the deep content, which goes deep into a category that we're talking about, whether we have a sponsor or don't have a sponsor. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about, um, you know, what are the top five trends that we should really be thinking of as healthcare business marketers and how our uh, coaching and how our guidance of our clients messaging and our clients brand needs to be uh, front and center. Well, I think, uh, you know, you, 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 hit the head, you hit the nail on the head with that first one there, just so we'll, 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 we'll start there. When you're talking about like that shorter form content leading to a longer, longer form content, uh, you know, for a while exclusively people thought of or they associated short form content with TikTok and then with this looming TikTok brand, uh, ban that has yet to happen. Uh, you know, I think there have been a lot of, of, of pushback on that, a lot of fear to jump into that. But the fact of the matter is you have brand, you have channels like YouTube, uh, Instagram, et cetera, all and now LinkedIn introducing all of their own short form content for people uh, that serves as the absolute springboard into your brand, into your longer form content. Because let's just call a spade a spade. We, our, our attention spans are, are definitely dwindling. You have more and more brands and content formats and and channels popping up by the day where you know you're getting blasted with content at all ends. And a long form video on YouTube don't always have time to, to look at, especially if I'm trying to just learn something fast. Uh, just to give you an example, with my son, I read him books every night before I put him to bed. Uh, we do this one book from Highlights where we just take a look at different animals and different vehicles and stuff like that. And he'll always point to it and he'll say, what's this? And I'll open up a YouTube short and I'll actually try to find him something, for example, of a hummingbird, how it's like, moves its wings faster than any other bird and it's the only bird that could fly in reverse learn this all from a youtube short right under 60 seconds i uh, there's probably a lot more substantive stuff to learn and that's that 60 plus second video uh but that that was the introduction to that brand now that i've had that touch point I get all sorts of uh, animal facts uh, in my YouTube shorts getting served to me, and I watch them all because uh, YouTube's algorithm notices, hey, this is how I've engaged with this content. I find it interesting. Here's more of it. And then it, it takes you off to um, the more longer form content. And this is an absolute must if you have a podcast. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, healthcare influencers like Dr. Mike, for example, on YouTube, he has a, he has a formal podcast, and you know his episodes are usually an hour or so plus, right? But are you going to sit there your first time you discover this guy's video and watch the full hour, or are you going to get exposed to his podcast the way many people got exposed to things like Joe Rogan and other podcasts in the form of clips? And now YouTube Shorts, he's sixty second uh, quick clips, and I think that you know that's a great entry point for startups in particular who might be more resource strapped, budget strapped. Uh, you know, building out more shorter form content is a great way to get started 
find the kind of content and topics that your audience is engaged with, right? Um, and then, you know, try to build it out from there. And if you do have longer form content, which is interesting, we were just speaking with an insurance marketing organization about this earlier in the day. Uh, if you have tons of, of, of longer form content, be it webinars or, um, you know, interviews with perhaps, you know, stakeholders of the company or other, you know, figures of the company or CMO, whoever it is, CEO, you can actually, uh, using AI, and we'll talk about that as another trend, take something like that video, break it out into however many short 60 second clips you would like by the topic, uh, have this all done in under five to 10 minutes, right? And then just get it out there, release one, two a week, and now you've got yourself a whole video strategy for the whole month. And to your point earlier, it stays on brand like you're talking about a consistent theme and topic which is i think paramount in social media especially nowadays uh, again our attention spans are all over the place if you're talking about several different things each week it's it's that kind of feels a little aimless right so yeah i like that you said that so as someone who develops long and short firm as well as written video primarily podcasting and then, of course, social media, which is a different environment. Sometimes it's jovial. Sometimes it's more meme driven. It's really building a personality in, an, in a relationship with our followers so that we can interact with those followers. But let's talk about that for a second. So you mentioned AI. What systems or what platforms have you seen do a really good job at taking a long form video that might be, in our case, our podcasts are usually right around 20 to 30 minutes long. And then the system dropping that in, maybe it's a, a, a video that I did, and then it would cut it up for me and kind of organize it into smaller little pieces of less than one minute uh, content. But what systems have you, have you used? So we, we've actually experimented with a ton, to be honest with you. And we always do. Uh, one, one, of our, one of my predictions for this year in marketing would be that you're going to start seeing this consolidation of uh, AI apps for this very reason. Uh, I think last year and the year before, the surge of, of AI apps, or there was an app or an extension for everything. And you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your team and your clients, right? Like we're in the consulting business to try them all, see which one's most effective, see which one, you know, uh, brings the most value for its buck, for the cost. Uh, so depending on client budgets, you know, we've always shifted around a little bit on on what we like, but you know, we've found success with things like video tap and podium to name a few. Uh, I think even now some of the podcasting platforms like a Riverside FM, uh, you know, they'll offer these sort of uh, capabilities as well, baked right into the platform. Hence, you know, that sort of prediction again that I made about this consolidation of AI, because I think using generative AI is obviously a big trend for this year, but I think the consolidation of those apps is absolutely inevitable and you should be prepared for something like that because it's naturally, you know, the Microsofts of the world, Riverside, even uh, you even see it with a Squadcast and them getting purchased by Descript or whatever, um, you know, they're, you're going to build out these, uh, it, these, these built in um, AI capabilities, whether, you know, you build them yourself or you're just acquiring all these smaller guys, because the fact of the matter is, is for AI to deliver on its promise, uh, a lot more investment needs to go into it. Uh, and as we can see right now, it already costs a lot of money for that computing. So, uh, yeah, de definitely, you know, the the consolidation of of uh, AI apps. But I think using generative AI, by the way, uh, what we've seen in that Digiday report is that people are using it, in my opinion, the way they should. And by people, I mean marketing teams, which is not to actually create content from scratch, but actually to help improve operational and executional efficiency. So that goes right back to what we were talking about, Todd, you know, taking these, these longer form videos, 
turning them into a bunch of shorter form clips, uh, building transcripts as well. That's something I just mentioned is built into uh, things like now Riverside FM, but also like D Descript. Uh, but you know, you can use tons of other tools to do that for you. When I remember when I first got into podcasting about seven, eight years ago, I would have to use uh, rev.com and I, I'd have to wait a couple hours till they would turn something around for me. And it costs like $20, $30 a pop. Uh, per episode. So, yeah. And those are short form episodes, by the way. So, yeah, I mean, we've, you know, using AI to improve efficiency is definitely a trend that I think teams should take advantage of. And I think a Salesforce report had showed that only 32% of marketing teams right now have actually implemented AI into their workflow. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. That is good information. I'm, ex I'm excited. You said We've been playing with Descript ourselves. I've definitely looked into Riverside, um, thinking that it was too expensive, but it, it's probably changed since I saw it. the last time I looked at it was two years ago. <laughs> so it's, oh wow, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's changed a lot. We used to be on Squadcast for all of our podcasts, and then we moved over to Riverside. And I'll give them a plug only because you know they've really helped us out a ton, but Riverside, you're not only really paying for like the quality and ease of use, but it's the customer support, which goes right back into that yeah. evergreen brand thing. I mean, their customer support is lightning fast, super thorough. Uh, and that, that goes a long way nowadays where it's hard to find things like that. It really does. It really does. All right. In wrapping up today, give us one more, give us one more tool that you've seen a valuable for our healthcare, um, uh, specific business to business uh, content creators and marketers that are out there. I think that the, the most important thing, uh, and this is the biggest trend in marketing, at least in the first half of this year, is a back to basics approach to brand building uh, and marketing as a whole. I think that what you're seeing is on social media channels, right? Uh, organic reach is shrinking more and more by the year, right? So, you know, you're not, you're only getting maybe to 1% or less of your uh, followers organically, you know, the social channels they want you to pay in order to get in front of them. And when you're posting links now on all of these social channels, they penalize the heck out of that too. So when you're when you're trying to share links, say, hey, here, check out our blog post for the week or check this out, you know, uh, here's a lead magnet that we put together, a report we did. Uh, yeah, that post is not getting served to many people. Uh, it goes for your, your newsletters on LinkedIn too. It will receive far less reach. So you have that to work against, right? And then on top of that, uh, again, like we were saying, using performance-based marketing tactics like paid media isn't really the way to go right now, especially when the reality is that so many brands are seeing their ad budgets get slashed. So the name of the game is actually about building things that you can own and creating experiences around these things that you own. So that's investing more in your website. Uh, a tip is 76% of healthcare marketers right now in 2024 are investing more in their websites to help build out better experiences, reports, blogs, case studies, things like that, newsletters. These are things that you actually own, and that's your first party data right there when you're talking to your own audience. You can send them surveys to learn what's working, what they like about your products or services, and so on and so forth. And having a podcast too, because uh, let us let me just tell you, we're seeing this huge shift right now, especially with ChatGPT rolling out their own uh, search engine and Google really stumbling upon itself and dropping the ball in search. Uh, we're seeing Generation Z, over 40% of them don't even use Google to find information. They're using social media and other platforms to find uh, information. And I predict that's, that podcast is going to be a massive part of that, as we're seeing podcasts right now expand their SEO capabilities. So I think it's a huge opportunity to take that same approach that we mentioned earlier about thinking of short form content take that approach to your podcast and start thinking about putting things together in the form of chapters and clips yeah. and sound bites so that people who search for answers, right? Search for information uh, can locate that stuff. And 
you know, studies have shown the top two reasons why people listen to podcasts is either A, get information on a topic, or B, get some professional perspective on a topic. So, you know, I think that's a huge opportunity, but it has to be built, you know, and it has to be something that you own. Vince, no algorithms on your website. <laughs> all the algorithms, all the yeah, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate your insights. Excited that you came back to this week in pharmacy. Um, I want to uh, shout you out to people that are listening. If you want to work with Vince or his group, if you go to grippymedia.com, uh, uh, that's grippy is G R I P P I uh, media.com. Uh, um, I've enjoyed your posts uh, over the years that we've known each other and the insights that you bring. We hope to have you back for sure, Vince. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. Excellent, excellent guest. Thank you to Vince uh, Grippy with Grippy Media. Hey, if there's uh, if there's something that you work on as a content developer or marketer that we missed in talking about, there's a lot in that. I would like to extend an invitation to you to talk more about the future of our medical science liaisons, representation of specific disease states, uh, maybe your own program, but regardless, I want healthcare marketers, highly intelligent, uh, evidence-based packed uh, content developers to come on the show and let's talk about how to make things better. Hey, this is a little shorter this week in pharmacy than normal, but I wanted to give a shout out to IPC. Thank you so much to the Independent Pharmacy Cooperative for your support of the pharmacy podcast network and i'd like to play you a message from them are you struggling with declining reimbursements and increasing costs eroding your profits are you worried about whether you will be in business in 2025 you need a buying group that cares as much about your business as you do you need ipc as an owner who has been in business for years you understand the importance of having a team of experts by your side to ensure the viability of your cash flow the sustainability of your business for over 40 years ipc has been a team of experts for our members and committed to the success of every single independent pharmacy. Learn how to improve the viability of your pharmacy at ipcrx.com. Hey, and that's it for this week in pharmacy. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for all you do as pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. Please reach out to the show. Uh, check us out at pharmacypodcast.com. Subscribe on all pharmacy, uh, on all podcasting platforms and be a part of this. Tell us what, like I said, tell us how and what you would like to talk about um, and, and meet up with us in person. If you are in anywhere in the Pittsburgh vicinity, uh, an hour away from Brownsville, Pennsylvania, we'd love to have you come down, spend time with us in the studio. And once again, be on the lookout for our two coverages of Cardinal Health's RBC Conference 2024 as well as the NACDS Total Store Expo 2024. Those three uh, three part series, both of them three part series are coming soon to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And that's it for this week in pharmacy. Thanks for listening.